Good morning. Um, I'm going to take a hopefully rather different approach to what you might normally get uh, about a maritime strategy for Australia. Um, the sort of title of my talk is Managing Australia's Maritime Strategy in an Era of Austerity. I'm not going to talk about sea control, sea denial, and all those things that you experts uh, are, are so fond of. I want to look at the bigger picture. I basically want to look at three things. One is the refocus to our own region, which is quintessentially a maritime region, after 10, 11 years in Afghanistan. In other words, the abiding nature of Australia's strategic geography. Second, I want to talk about the defence budget and money and how we're going to have to refocus in a much tougher way on resources in a prolonged period or era of austerity. And finally, I'll talk very briefly about the main theme of this conference, and that is naval diplomacy, and how we need to be better at managing and orchestrating the peace in our part of the world. Many decades ago, in the late 1970s, when I was head of the National Assessment Staff, which was probably the best job I ever had, I worked for Australia's most powerful Mandarin, Sir Arthur Tang. Sir Arthur was the Permanent Secretary of the Foreign Ministry for 11 years and the Permanent Secretary of Defence for nine years. He was an extremely powerful man and a man to be feared, and I feared him. He taught me two very important principles which I want to leave with you in this talk. The first principle of Sir Arthur Tang's was that the most important single piece of documentation for any defence planner is a map of one's own country, by which he meant your country and your surrounding region. And I must say, when I was Deputy Secretary of Defence, I insisted that all my staff, civilian and military, had a map of Australia and the region on their wall. Otherwise, how can you comprehend four structure priorities? The second Tang uh, guidance was that strategy without money ain't strategy. And too many of my academic friends and media commentators simply don't understand that. They don't address it because generally they're not comfortable with it. And yet it is central. Money is not a free good. So that's my approach. So now to my speech. Australia's defence policy faces two crucial challenges. The first is that our strategic priority must now shift from Afghanistan to our region of primary strategic concern to our north, which is primarily a maritime theatre of operations. Second, we face, as I've just said, a period of fiscal austerity in which resources available for defence will be constrained. It would be far from easy to manage these two contending policy pressures. So my main theme to this audience is that our strategic geography must return to its proper place in defence planning and that the financial outlook demands a rethink of our defence priorities. As my good friend Rear Admiral Richard Hill states in his seminal work, Maritime Strategy for Medium Powers, the mismatch between what one would like to be able to do as a nation state and what one's resources will allow one to do is the central dilemma for the medium power. This certainly applies to Australia as a medium power. There is always much we would like to do and all too few resources with which to do it. For the foreseeable future, discipline in resource allocation in defence will have to be applied much more rigorously. There is also the issue of our approach to strategy. As Admiral Hill again observes, overreaching abroad and weakness closer to home is always a danger for middle powers. In my view, we must not fall into the trap of losing our sense of strategic direction like we did after our long involvement in the Vietnam War. Turning now to strategic policy changes to support a maritime strategy. This year's 2013 Defence White Paper makes it clear that Australia's geography requires a maritime strategy for deterring and defeating attacks against Australia and contributing to the security of our immediate neighbourhood and the wider region. 
This requires the ability to generate a joint force able to operate in a maritime environment that extends, in my view, from the eastern Indian Ocean to the entire South Pacific and from all of Southeast Asia to the Southern Ocean. This amounts to more than 20% of the Earth's surface, which is a challenging operational, operational task, I think you'll agree, for a defense force of less than 60,000. While the Abbott government has promised a new white paper within 18 months, it has confirmed that its defense policy objectives are basically the same as those in the Howard government's 2000 defense white paper, and they are as follows in the Ab Abbott government's uh, defense policy. One, ensuring the defense of Australia and its direct approaches. Two, fostering security and stability in our immediate neighborhood. Three, supporting strategic stability in the wider Asia-Pacific region, and four, supporting global security. These are no different from those in this year's 2013 white paper, so I'm reasonably confident we've got a basic bipartisan approach to strategic policy, not to money and not to force structure, however. The 2013 defense white paper's description of Australia's military strategy emphasizes the importance of the maritime domain to controlling the sea and air approaches to the continent. And it seeks to optimize the significant advantages to be gained from the strategic depth provided by the geography of our continent. When we compare ourselves with many other nations in our region, for instance, the Republic of Korea, we should be grateful for the security that comes from our unique strategic geography. Although the Howard government's 2000 defense white paper also talked about Australia needing a fundamentally maritime strategy, it failed to provide much detail and was overtaken by events for the following decade in Iraq and Afghanistan. And therein lies a problem. Because of our preoccupation with expeditionary forces in distant theaters, we have run down some of the most crucial capabilities we now need to support a maritime strategy. These include anti-submarine warfare, mine hunting and sweeping, electronic warfare, and maritime surveillance and detection. Moreover, our bases and facilities in the north and northwest of the continent cannot sustain high-tempo military operations, a problem that left unaddressed will be compounded as new ships and new aircraft are introduced into the force. These deficiencies, ladies and gentlemen, require urgent rectification. We need to refocus on the highly demanding nature of military operations in an archipelagic environment. This means refamiliarizing the ADF with what is involved in operating in the seas of Southeast Asia and the South Pacific and the Eastern Indian Ocean. For the Navy, operating on and under the sea in the relatively confined waterways to Australia's north in particular will mean that avoiding detection and acquiring targeting data will be demanding as forces in the region modernize their capabilities. The technical specifications of sonars and radars will require optimization for potential military operations in the archipelago, as will the, be the capacity to detect and track targets in a theater of operations where it will be easier for the opposition to conceal itself. All this points to the need to reinstitute those capabilities that have been allowed to be run down, for understandable reasons, in a period when the Defense Force has been preoccupied with operations in Afghanistan and the Middle East. Intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities, and targeting and network analysis must now be prioritized for our own unique physical operating environment. There are three geographical areas that now require the attention of the ADF. First, it needs to reacquaint itself with the north and northwest of our own continent and our maritime and air approaches. The Force Posture Review last year, conducted by two former Secretaries for Defense, Alan Hawke and Rick Smith, found that some of our northern bases, as I've said, have inadequate logistic support and infrastructure and lack protection. The Abbott government has said it will consider the need for a greater presence of our military forces in northern Australia especially 
in resource-rich areas with little or no current military presence. ADF, take note of that, please. If we are to protect our extensive maritime territory and strategically significant offshore territories and economic resources, more attention will need to be given to the adequacy of our air, naval and land bases, as well as access to commercial infrastructure in the north. In addition, we now need to pay more attention to the Indian Ocean, and particularly the eastern part of it, which will increasingly feature in Australia's defence planning and maritime strategy. The second area of strategic focus is our immediate neighbourhood, where we have important interests and responsibilities. The security and stability of our immediate neighbourhood, which we share with Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste and the small island states of the South Pacific, are interests where Australia has a central strategic role. We are the predominant power. It is a part of the world where we must be able to intervene, if required. The drawing down of our troop presence in Timor-Leste and the Solomon Islands after more than 10 years does not spell an end to the requirements in the South Pacific for humanitarian and disaster relief, capacity building and governance, potential peacekeeping operations and military intervention. It is not too difficult to contemplate some demanding contingencies for the ADF in this part of the world. There is an important role here for Australia's new amphibious capabilities based on the two 27,000 ton LHDs. These will present a serious challenge to both the Army and Navy. They will be the largest ships ever operated by the ADF, as you all know, and will represent what the white paper terms, quote, a step change, unquote, in the way Australia deploys its land forces and their supporting systems in amphibious operations. The white paper notes that the initial focus will be on security, stabilization, humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief tasks for these vessels. Of course, the LHDs will be able to operate much further afield, but if they are to undertake high intensity operations, it will take a great deal of the ADF's key military assets, including those not only of the Navy, but also of the RAAF, to protect them. The demands of such operations would risk the ADF becoming a one-shot defense force, something we must avoid especially if the potential operational gain is not worth the strategic risk. The third area of strategic focus, as I've said, is Southeast Asia. And this is new in this white paper, and I have every confidence that the Abbott government will also pursue it. And as you've seen, the Prime Minister's first overseas visit twice already has been to Indonesia. Southeast Asia, in my definition, includes its seas and straits and the South China Sea. I consider the security of Southeast Asia to be an enduring Australian strategic interest because of its proximity to our northern approaches and crucial shipping lanes. Southeast Asia is the fulcrum point between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, in what some observers are inclined to see as a single strategic entity called the Indo-Pacific. I disagree with that all-embracing geopolitical definition in terms of what is a feasible strategic focus for Australia. It is the Eastern Indian Ocean and the seas of Southeast Asia that should be our priority strategic concern and for structure priority. The priority we give to Southeast Asia should include being able to help Southeast Asian partners to meet external challenges, particularly given the uncertainty surrounding the strategic transformation of our wider region. This means Australia should be prepared to make substantial military contributions if necessary. In this context, we need to give much more thought to the sort of ADF joint force that might be appropriate for credible Southeast Asian contingencies, as well as to how the ADF might operate in closer partnership with Southeast Asian countries as they become more capable over time. We will also have a modest capability to contribute to high intensity conventional conflict in Northeast Asia. That is not, however, a part of the world where we can make a real military difference. Even so, meeting our alliance commitments to the United States might involve niche contributions, 
by some of the high technology assets that we acquire for our own force structure purposes and that would also be relevant to Northeast Asian contingencies. A useful contribution in the event of high intensity conventional war in Northeast Asia would be for us to be able to contribute to what the Americans call a distant blockade, which for us would be a closer military operation to our north. The White Paper observes that our national prosperity is underpinned by our ability to trade through Indo-Pacific maritime routes and that the ADF needs to be prepared to play a role in keeping these sea lanes secure. That should not be interpreted, in my view, to mean that Navy will be required to defend sea lanes at great distance all the way to the North Pacific or all the way to the Western Indian Ocean. Rather, we should concentrate our efforts on operations and focal areas relatively closer to home, including the protection of trade vital to our economy. All of this means that we need to focus on what is affordable and credible militarily with a defense force the size of ours. In the event of high intensity conventional combat operations in our region, we would always need to hold sufficient forces to defend ourselves. Our military resources are limited and the first call upon them must be in respect of our own national security tasks. It should be a fundamental tenet of Australian strategic policy that the scale of our contributions will be determined by our national interests and the limits of our capacity. And I want now to turn to the latter, that is, the affordability and limits to Australia's defence capacity. The outlook for the world economy is in many ways the biggest strategic uncertainty facing us. Until recently, Australia has not been affected significantly by the economic damage done to the United States and much of Europe, where many nations are facing at least a decade of poor economic growth. And although the world's economic weight is shifting from the west to the east, China too faces challenging economic and social problems. China is not yet a superpower in the real sense of that word. word. But its build-up of naval capabilities is raising concerns in the region. <clears throat> America, in my view, will continue to be the world's strongest military power and the most influential power in our region for the foreseeable future, despite some rather trendy speculation about the current short-term damage done by the US Congress. That is not a long-term issue. However, the United States is unlikely to conduct large-scale and prolonged stability operations such as we have seen in the last two decades in Iraq and Afghanistan. Most Western nations are now likely to be much more selective about participating in large-scale ground conflicts in the Middle East as we are currently seeing with regard to Syria. We should not rule out making modest military contributions in, in the future but Australia is unlikely to be involved in major military operations in the Middle East, in my view. For Australia, our economic outlook too has changed after over 22 years of unbroken economic growth, the best in the developed world. We now face the fact the resources boom is slowing, government revenues have taken a big structural hit, economic growth is well below trend, and the federal government budget faces long run deficits. Something serious has to be done about cutting government expenditure, and yet we continue to load the budget with future debt. This means that defence should not expect to return to the good times any time soon. There is, in my view, a good case to spend more on defence as soon as practicable. However, as Peter Jennings noticed on Monday, there is nothing magic about a particular percentage of GDP. What matters more is the relationship between our strategic outlook, realistic assessments of risk, and prudent hedging against the need to use military force. The fact is that our region has been at peace now for almost 40 years since the end of the Vietnam War. And in my view, there is a low likelihood of war between the major powers, and this is an important judgment. The reasons for this are twofold. The fear of the use of nuclear weapons will remain a huge deterrent, and second, the world is so interconnected economically that there would be no winners in a major power war in this part of the world. Even so, miscalculation and misjudgment short of major war are a risk, as they have been throughout history. 
And in our part of the world, there are plenty of territorial and ideological tensions and jockeying for influence by the rising powers. It is therefore prudent for Australia to develop a capable, high technology force with which to defend itself and its vital interests. However, the costs of projecting and sustaining military power is increasing and the range of our interests is expanding just as defence budgets are effectively declining. The ADF will have to deal simultaneously with increased sustainment costs for ageing equipment and a highly ambitious new acquisition programme looking forward to 2030 of in the order of $270 billion. This means we need to set priorities among competing military requirements much more rigorously than we have in the past. We cannot aspire to do everything. In my view, we are in for a significant period of fiscal constraint until the government turns around the Commonwealth budget fiscal deficit. Under these circumstances, it will not be easy for any government to find large increases for defence spending. I note the Abbott government's commitment to return the defence budget to 2% of GDP within a decade. According to Aspie's Mark Thompson, this will involve 5.3% annual growth sustained over each of the next 10 years. The historical record shows, ladies and gentlemen, that no Australian government has been able to sustain those sorts of compound growth rates in defence funding for more than a few years, except in the First World War, the Second World War and Vietnam. After the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, Malcolm Fraser in the early 1980s tried to sustain that sort of growth, but it only occurred over three, over five years. And that was seen, uh, in his words, as an international crisis that could have involved, his words, not mine, the Third World War. We do not face those situations. Instead, we will need to take a harsh look at the entire structure and functions of the defence organisation and how it spends money. Too often, defence decisions have been dominated by the domestic politics of defence policy, parochial bureaucratic interests, both military and civilian, and sheer inertia in the cumbersome machinery we have created on Russell Hill. The government has foreshadowed a first principles review of the Department of Defence's structure and major processes, with a focus on minimising bureaucracy and maximising frontline resources. The government's policy also says it will reform the, D, the DMO, the Defence Material Organisation, to make its procurements more cost effective. That is something that, in my view, clearly needs attention. Are you aware that the DMO's running costs are practically the same as the entire running cost budget of our Foreign Affairs Department? So what to do? First, escalating manpower costs are threatening to undermine the delivery of sharp-end warfighting capabilities. Traditionally, our defence budget has been allocated one-third each to personnel costs, operations and investment. Today, however, the personnel share of the defence budget has risen to 42% and the investment share has fallen dramatically to 22%. Given the capital acquisition programme ahead of us, the investment share must be restored, in my view, to 33%. And even that might not be enough for the modernisation programme currently envisaged to be sustained for the next one or two decades. That means finding an additional $2.9 billion a year if we go back up to 32% for the capital investment vote, which should be one of the first priorities, in my opinion, of the Abbott government for the defence portfolio. If these additional funds of $2.9 billion a year cannot be found from the federal budget, then there should be a review of ways in which defence personnel costs and the costs of operating the huge defence enterprise can be reduced. The fact is there has been a tremendous blowout in defence personnel numbers and ranks. According to ASPE, the civilian workforce has grown by 30% over the last 13 years and the military workforce by only 16%. Over the same period, the number of senior civilian uh, executives, senior executive service, has increased by 63%, and military style rank officers by 58%. When I was Deputy Secretary, nearly 20 years ago now, we had three Deputy Secretaries. There's now 17 
people being paid as deputy secretary. And 20 years ago, we had 72,000 in the ADF, and now we've got 59,000. You can see, I mean, what we have gone and created. The numbers of civilian and military officers of colonel and lieutenant colonel rank or equivalent has grown by 104% in the public service and 44% in the ADF. Moreover, the percentages of officers in the ADF has grown from 17% in 1989 to 24% in 2010. This means there are now around only three other ranks for every officer compared with five in 1989. So what to do about all this? In my view, consideration should be given by the new Australian government to radically cut in the defence civilian bureaucracy of 21,000. Even if that number were cut in half, however, by 10,000, it would only result in savings of about $1.1 billion a year and still leave a shortfall in my $2.9 billion a year, a shortfall of $1.8 billion, non-trivial sums of money. This would imply that cuts to the defence force, whose costs per capita are 30% more than those of civilians, might also have to be considered. Public service costs account for less than 20% of the overall defence personnel budget. So, if a shift is to be made to allow for force modernisation, then I'm afraid that ADF personnel costs and efficiencies will also need, in my view, probably have to make a contribution. If, however, governments are not willing to, complete, to contemplate either cutting defence personnel or providing additional funds for the defence budget, it will be necessary to zero-base the defence capability plan and see what is practically affordable. For example, it may be that we have to contemplate acquiring less than 100 Joint Strike Fighters for $16 billion and fewer than 12 submarines for up to $30 billion and invite Army to reconsider its $19 billion bid for Project Land 400 to defeat a peer competitor on the battlefield, whatever that means. These three projects alone account for more than one quarter of the $275 billion defence acquisition plan out to 2030. My view is that the huge cost of these programmes needs to be reconsidered against our economic circumstances. And some of them simply do not have any plausible strategic justification. These are projects that have gone well beyond the scale and risks in any previous big defence projects and will crowd out what is required to acquire other important elements of a technologically complex force through their sheer demands on future budgets. So as the government considers big capability proposals like these, it will be important for it to understand the scale of investment involved and what other defence capabilities might need to be foregone. We can't have everything. Finally, let me conclude with a short section on keeping the peace and the role of naval diplomacy, which has been central to this um, conference. Australia has been free from the threat of military attack for almost 70 years now. The use of military force is not, of course, adopted lightly by one country against another. Our strategic assessments identify many uncertainties, but the prospects for keeping the peace are, in my view, relatively favourable. Of course, any prudent defence force has to hedge against an unpredictable future. That is why Australia must focus on developing a high-technology, capable ADF that has a clear margin of technological advantage in our region. The drawdown of the ADF's major operations overseas presents an opportunity to rebalance Australia's force posture, to refocus efforts in support of regional security. These operational drawdowns should be used to increase the ADF's capacity for regional engagement and so help shape a cooperative security environment. As a not in insubstantial local power, Australia is able to influence regional developments that support the present, basically peaceful, strategic environment to our advantage. We should not allow pessimism to become a self-fulfilling wish. However, we need to be alert to lesser situations developing in a manner adverse to the interests of a medium power like Australia. Therefore, we maintain credible high-end military capabilities to act decisively when required, deter potential adversaries and strengthen our regional influence. 
Defence already makes a substantial contribution to Australia's regional engagement in support of a favourable security environment. Our force, our force posture and preparedness decisions play an important role in positioning the ADF to enhance engagement and contribute to security and stability in the Indo-Pacific, with priority given to Southeast Asia as befits Australia's strategic environment. We have patiently built over many decades an enduring network of defence contacts and relationships throughout Southeast Asia. Our defence cooperation programmes, military exercises, consultations and defence force visits are a crucial part of our defence diplomacy. Service to service relationships are already strong with a number of regional countries and provide a firm basis to deepen particular security partnerships. Our membership of the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus, the East Asia Summit, and the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Organisation, APEC, underlines our commitment to confidence building and strengthening rules based institutions in our region. Whilst it is true that the Asian region lacks the sort of arms control agreements that existed in Europe in the Cold War, the fact is we do not face the same dangerous ideological confrontation of that era. In view of the great diversity of the region and the different security concerns of the countries in it, we simply cannot copy the experience of other regions in building confidence, trust and transparency. We need our own unique regional approach. On behalf of our Department of Foreign Affairs, I have represented Australia since 2006 at all seven meetings of the ASEAN Regional Forum's Expert and Eminent Persons Group. What a fantastic title that is. This group is tasked by ARF ministers to advance practical preventive diplomacy measures and confidence building with the 27 countries of the ARF. As I've said, I've sat at all uh, seven meetings over the last seven years. This group is playing a significant role in building up mutual understanding and mutual trust in our region. This, in my opinion, is the way to manage differences and avoid tension. And right now, ARF ministers have tasked us to come up with a set of priorities for ministerial endorsement by the 27 countries of priorities for building preventive diplomacy. In this context, I consider that naval diplomacy is one of the key non-threatening areas of military cooperation that we need to develop further. Naval diplomacy does not have the same territorial sensitivities as boots on the ground or aircraft overflights. It can embrace the entire gamut of our international interests, ranging from fostering goodwill, demonstrating our way of life, supporting our trade interests, showcasing our military capabilities, and supporting our regional military engagement. Maritime security, I don't need to remind you, is of crucial interest to us all in this room due to the importance of shipping and seaborne trade throughout the entire Indo-Pacific region. Maritime security related issues represent some of the most pressing and potentially useful areas for cooperation in the region. They range from conventional maritime security issues, including state sovereignty concerns, to non-traditional maritime security issues such as piracy, terrorism, natural disasters, drug smuggling, and search and rescue. However, as the ASEAN Regional Forum's 2011 work plan on maritime security observes, and I quote, cooperation in some areas still falls short of, what, of that which is necessary, unquote. I note in this regard that of late, there has been a significant increase in the potential for military confrontation over disputed maritime territories in Northeast Asia and the South China Sea. It is important that antagonistic naval confrontations do not occur and slide into the use of military force, either by accident or design. The declaration from the August 2013, that's this year's um, ADMM Plus ministerial meeting, pointedly, pointedly observes the need to, and again I quote, establish practical measures that reduce vulnerability to miscalculations and avoid misunderstandings and undesirable incidents at sea, end of quote. I have been pressing for some time now in the ARF group that I represent Australia on 
on the need for a multilateral avoidance of naval incidents at sea agreement. What we are talking about here is agreeing to operate in accordance with the international law, including the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the commonly accepted rules of the nautical road, agreed communications procedures when ships encounter each other, and adopting procedures which reduce the risk of miscalculation and undesirable incidents at sea. And let me remind you, at the height of the Cold War in 1972, the Soviet Union and the United States had such an avoidance of naval incidents at sea agreement, which said, in close proximity naval maneuvering, you shall not point your guns, missiles, torpedo tubes at each other. You shall not uh, shine high intensity lasers on the bridges of other warships. And you shall not interfere with the line of steaming of a warship taking off or landing aircraft. What is wrong with that? And why can't we get agreement? And by the way, Japan has such an agreement with Russia from 1993 using exactly almost the same words. And I've talked to the Japanese Defense Ministry the week before last in this town, and they confirm there have been no major incidents and it works well. My final paragraph. The aim of such a multilateral avoidance of naval incidents at sea agreement would be to avoid unintended collisions or conflict through the exercise of self-restraint, which will be guided by an agreed regional maritime security regime. If, however, we cannot move towards such an understanding in the near future, then I fear a crisis or conflict on the high seas may well be inevitable. Thank you. <laughs>